I came home a hero. That's what everybody said. And now I had the medal to prove it. So trying to deny it only made people sore. I've got lots of acquaintances. A few good friends. The only people I'd ever confide in were other soldiers. I could never quite connect with people the way I did with them. For years after I got back, I started appreciating the little things. Clean socks, warm food, a hot shower, sheets. And that peculiar feeling of not having to worry that somebody was shooting at you. And little things started to annoy me. People complaining about their bus being late, honking their horns in traffic. Their coffee's not hot enough. Yeah. I complain too. About the Parkinson's mostly. It just, it just leaves you so tired. But then a friend of mine, he nudges me in the ribs and he says, Gino, Gino, what are you griping about? The Pope has Parkinson's. He's running the whole church. There was a time when I had to lie completely still. If I moved, if I twitched, I'd be dead. And now I... I can't stop moving or twitching. Even if I wanted to. If my life depended on it. I couldn't do it. I think that's God's way of saying that what I did was okay. I still wonder, is it ever okay to kill? He said it himself, thou shalt not kill. Well, I broke that commandment many times over. And yet I still feel close to God. How do we come to terms with that? You don't think about killing people when you're going off to war. You think about it being the right thing to do. You don't say to yourself, these are the things worth killing for. No, you, you say these are the things worth dying for. I saw my first dead body. June 6th, 1944. We came in at low tide. The obstacles the Germans had put on the beach to rip out the bellies of the landing crafts, well, you could see them. They were like giant spiders on the beach. And we were all sick. Our boat was next to this huge battle cruiser that was firing off shells into the cliffs. And every time one of those huge shells went off, our little boat would get swamped by the kickback wave. And we're all getting wetter and sicker. There were just shells and bullets coming from every direction. The problem was, there didn't seem to be anything to be firing at. You couldn't see the Germans. We saw some tracers coming from this huge concrete gun emplacement that was so big, it made my rifle look like a pea shooter. And then, the gate went down. There was no shame in being afraid. We were all afraid. But what scared me the most was that I would become so afraid that I'd run out and desert my buddies. That's worse than dying, because when you're dead, you're dead. But if you run, you 
You'll have to live with that for the rest of your life. We were climbing over the side of the boat just trying to get out of there. The guys wearing heavy packs on their backs. They hit the water and they drowned. Dragged under by their own weight. And you see a fella drowning. And you stop. You try to help him, right? No, you do what you were trained to do. Keep moving forward, crouch and fire, move! We made it across that beach. And we got to this hillside near the bluff. Now a unit of sappers, those are the guys who clear out minefields. They had gotten there before us. Some of them were missing a leg. Some were missing two but they had shot themselves up with morphine. And they were telling us where it was safe to step. And as we're getting to the top, somebody said, well, it looks like we're going to live to see at least one more day. And as I turned around to look back at where we'd been, one of my buddies said, don't look back there, Eddie. But I did. And I saw so many dead. They were lying everywhere. God. I hated that sight. We were just kids, you know? High school kids, mostly. But after we got off that beach, we weren't kids anymore. Work and age are pretty fast. My wife, Mary, she knows. When the thunder and the lightning comes, she sees my back stiffen up. She knows that it brings me back there. I read a memoir of a guy who fought in the South Pacific. He was feeling the same things we all were, wondering if he had what it took, not only to fight, but to survive. And his sergeant said to him, Son, you're going to learn before you get out of here that one of the most brutal things in the world is your average 19-year-old American boy. Over that summer, we fought and marched our way through the fields and towns of northern France. On the night of September 4th, we reached a little town in Belgium called sars la -Briere. Now our company was ordered to stop the movement of German troops that were going through the country. The Germans were trying to make their way back home. So everybody got to work digging their foxholes, and while we were digging, a couple of people from the village came over and they told us there were many, many German soldiers headed down the road, straight at us. They kept on saying, Buku de Bosch, Buku de Bosch. This is about dusk. Sergeant Patinsky sends out a patrol to find out where the enemy was. Well, they come back in about a half an hour and they report that there were about 100 German soldiers marching down the road straight at us. Well, that sounded like Buku de Bosch to me. So we doubled up our efforts and got ready to hold that road. And then we saw them. We couldn't believe our eyes. 
They were ahead of us. They were behind us on our flanks. There was a lot more than the 100 reported by the patrol. It was like they were coming down from out of the sky or popping up from the ground. Well, after the first volley of fire, those Germans scattered like ants. But they came back. Four more times. The last time they came through, all they found were lifeless bodies. My assistant gunner and I were laying face down in our foxhole. He was on top of me. He was dead. I remember feeling his breath on my face. Just a moment. And then he was gone. He was brand new, too. A replacement. He just came over from the States a few days before. And he was just a kid. I was all by myself now. And the Germans. They started jabbing the bodies. To make sure everybody was dead. They stuck a bayonet in me. In my buttocks. They stuck me four times. And I didn't move. It was then that I knew that God was with me in that hole. I remember thinking about the spear that they, they thrust into the side of Christ. I didn't move, so they were convinced I was dead. And as soon as they had passed, I opened fire. I killed them all, and they fell without a sound in front of that gun. ramifications of what I had done, it, it hadn't sunk in yet. My only thoughts were about staying alive, making it back home. Or what would happen if I got captured? You know, what would they do to me? And then I remembered, I had a rosary in my front pocket. Seemed like a good time for it. I was clutching that rosary so tight, my hand bled. Then another group of Germans came down. I figured if I kept shooting, they couldn't take me alive. They couldn't take me alive and they'd have to kill me. person left in the world. We annihilated each other. Down to the last man. Me. Everyone else was dead. But then, the earth moved. Just a little bit. And I realized there was one German soldier left. 25 yards out in front of my gun. But I could tell he was wounded. And he knew I was there. I could hear him moving around, calling out to his comrades for help. Nobody came. I still remember the sound of his voice. Leb noch jemand. He tried to shoot at me, just once, and that was all. The rest of the time, he just watched. It was him, watching me, watching him. I could have killed him, too. I could have sprayed that dirt with my machine gun and taken him out. I 
enough had already died. I was tired of, of killing. I just didn't want to do it anymore. At least not on that night. And then at daybreak, one of their medics came out to, to help him. Well, the medic picked him up, then he carried him out of there, back down the road. And I remember thinking, well, I'll never see him again. And I was wrong. I see him every time I close my eyes. Finally, at daybreak, the Americans appeared. And they looked at me like I was, like I was supposed to be dead. Almost like I was Lazarus, just out of the grave. Now, nobody said anything to me at first. They all sort of took a step back a bit. But then, I told them I was hungry. And then they knew that I was real. I asked Sergeant Patinsky if he wouldn't mind if I went and prayed for the dead. Our dead and theirs. Because they all had families. Some of them had kids. And they all had mothers who would soon get the news that their son was killed in combat. And I was responsible for that. We went to the small church that was nearby. I remember as I walked in the door, I put my fingers in the holy water. That's when I realized my fingers were all burned from the machine gun. The war leaves little time for reflection. If I sat down and thought about what I did that night, maybe I would have lost faith. I fired 2,000 rounds. And I killed 51 human beings. Old Abe said, in times of great conflict, both parties claim to act in accord with the will of God. Both may be, and one must be wrong. For God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. And the Lord said, Thou shalt not kill. Period. There's nothing that comes after that. He didn't say, except in war, or unless they're Nazis. What are we supposed to think? That he left something out? We had to think that killing Germans was somehow what God wanted us to do. But how can that be? God was with me in that trench. I felt it. He kept me still. He dried the bees of sweat on my head. He kept my eyes open. But he did not stop me from getting off those rounds. So if he was with me, he could not have been with them. Eventually, they sent me over to Jersey. I finally got a 10-day furlough. <laughs> and on my first day out, two MPs come knocking at my front door, there to pick me up. Now, they didn't tell me why at first. So I'm trying to think of what I'd done to get myself arrested. <laughs> but then they finally told me. They said I was to report to the White House and that I was to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor Well, this is not standard stuff for a kid from Peckville. This is like being told you're going to the North Pole to meet Santa Claus. When I got back from the war, I started getting all these invitations to social events. 
Kiwanis Club, Rotary Club, Boy Scouts. And they all wanted me to make a speech. Well, I said, fine. I'd be happy to come, but what I really want to do is say the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> you see, that saved me from making a speech. But I never said no. What if I said no? And then the next guy, and then the next guy, and so on down the line. Now, before you know it, the, the flag is being rolled up like a tablecloth, stuck under a cushion until the next holiday. Well, I, I figure for the good things I have, I owe somebody. So I'm gonna keep on giving until I can't give anymore. And each time we send our troops off to fight, there's another part of me that trembles on the inside. You see, it's hard to forget that the people who send these troops off to fight, they don't do the fighting themselves. The soldiers do their duty. American soldiers always have, and they always will. And sometimes they come home whole, and sometimes they come home in pieces that need to be put back together again. And if there was ever anything I could do to help, well, then I would. They could tell me what they'd seen. Soldiers coming home from war, they speak a different language. You can't learn it by reading books, and you can't learn it by earning degrees. You can only learn it by being in that hole, watching the enemy in silhouette, by spilling his blood. But you see, it's, you know, it's not just the fighting. It's the healing, too. The medal is what people remember me for. Lots of guys earned one and deserved one, too. Doesn't mean they get it, though. I was in the right place at the right time, and the right people heard about what I did. But I fought with guys who did what I did ten times over, and no one even knows their names. So, in a lot of ways, I, I treat it like it belongs to everybody else.
The Valley Community Library in Peckville is home to the Gino Murley Room, where you can learn more about the life and wartime exploits of Congressional Medal of Honor recipient Gino Murley. Inside, a diverse arrangement of photographs, personal mementos, and Murley's Medal of Honor uniquely tell the story of a Northeastern Pennsylvania hero. The room is open during normal library business hours.